will be drier towards the north and east. And a few showers likely for parts of Northern Ireland. Here it's going to turn dry with clear spells for a time before rain arrives during the early hours of Monday. So the showers easing then for many overnight with some dry weather before rain arrives from the west and the southwest later. And that's how this very mixed weather picture is shaping up into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me, noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Elon Musk continues to cause consternation at Twitter, Marine Le Pen steps down as party leader in France, and an able-bodied man is celebrated for identifying as a disabled woman. This is Free Speech Nation. Welcome to the show. It is becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish between reality and fiction. Politics, in particular, seems to have taken a surreal turn. In the USA, you have a president who recently claimed that there are 54 states, had addressed a dead politician at a White House conference, and at one public event managed to mix up his wife and his sister, which is not just grounds for divorce, but possibly a criminal inquiry. The UK hardly fares any better with a government that appears to be trying to set a new world record for the number of prime ministers and chancellors it can get through in one year. 
When Joe Biden recently referred to the new UK Prime Minister as Rashid Sanouk, maybe he wasn't mistaken after all. Maybe this was just a premonition of someone we haven't seen yet. But even though the world of politics has become self-satirising, that's nothing compared to the world of identity politics. This week on Norwegian television on a show called Good Morning Norway, there was a sympathetic interview with a 53-year-old able-bodied man who identifies as a handicapped woman. Despite having no physical disability, he uses a wheelchair most of the time. Is this a ruse? a way to get access to the more spacious public toilet facilities? It seems not, because this man says he's always wished that he was born a woman who was paralysed from the waist down. And that's his truth, or her truth, or whatever it is we're meant to say. So now it seems that we can be trans-disabled and find ourselves a platform on TV to have our delusions validated. This, of course, is reminiscent of Rachel Dolezal. You remember Rachel Dolezal, artist and civil rights activist, who was formerly president of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. There was just one problem. Is that your dad? Yeah, that's, that's my dad. This man right here is your father? Right there? Do you have a question about that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was wondering if uh, <laughs> if your dad really is an African-American man. That's a very, I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're implying. Are you African-American? I don't, I don't understand the question of, I did tell you that, yes, that's my dad. And you, he was unable to come in January. Are your parents, I'm are they white? I, Yes, it turned out that this trailblazing African-American activist was, in fact, white. Dolezal was rightly criticised for this, even though it does seem that this could be a genuine feeling that she has, some kind of psychological condition. And yet, identity politics has reached such heights of, of absurd contradictions that Dolezal is considered a monstrous fraud, and yet an able-bodied Norwegian man is celebrated for calling himself disabled. A while ago, the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins posed a question on Twitter about the inconsistencies of identity politics. He said, in 2015, Rachel Dolezal, a white chapter president of NAACP, was vilified for identifying as black. Some men choose to identify as women and some women choose to identify as men. You will be vilified if you deny that they are literally what they identify as. Discuss. As he pointed out, Dawkins wasn't attempting to disparage trans people. He was just trying to initiate a conversation about what the rules are here, because it can be quite confusing. But by tweeting this, by simply posing a question, Dawkins had, had committed an act of heresy. He was rebuked by the American Humanist Association and had his Humanist of the, of the Year award formally rescinded. But aren't scientists supposed to ask questions? Isn't that something we're all allowed to do? Because let's be honest, we all seem to instinctively know when not to take someone's identity seriously. For instance, there was the case of Stephanie Walsh, the 46-year-old man who, after 23 years of marriage, suddenly realised he was actually a six-year-old girl <laughs> and left his wife to live with some new adoptive parents. <laughs> Now, look, I didn't realise that it worked that way. You know, when I was a child and I was trying to sneak into horror films at the cinema, it would have been really easy if I knew that I could just identify as 18. Well, these, of course, are all just extreme examples, you might say, and yes, I would agree with that. But the extremes of identity politics are rapidly becoming the norm. Last week, TikTok star Dylan Mulvaney had a public televised meeting with the President of the United States. And why? Because Dylan identifies as a girl. Take a look at this. Day 66, being a girl, and today I'm in nature. Trees, I love them. Water, lakes, I love them. Heels, they're my hiking heels. I love them. Bridges, love them. Coconut water, love it. Not an ad, just love it. Wind turbine, love it. <laughs> Meadows, love them. I'm scared of getting Lyme disease. Love ya. Ah! Oh. Did you see that? I gotta get out of here. Did you see that? There's a dragon. Oh my god. 
Now, it seems pretty clear to me that that's probably a hoax, because that kind of ditzy, prancing, scatterbrained depiction of girlhood is too obviously based on misogynistic stereotypes to be real, isn't it? I mean, I can't be sure. Does he believe it? Is he pranking us? If so, this is expert-level trolling. And was the Instagram influencer, Ollie London, being sincere when he claimed to be trans-Korean, even though he was white? I mean, he had surgery to look Korean and in doing so sparked accusations of indulging in racist stereotypes. And then what about the woodwork teacher in Canada who wears huge prosthetic breasts to school? Now, many people have pointed out that this looks very much like fetish gear, but the school defended him, saying this was her gender identity and must be validated. And this is the point. The culture wars have reached the point where we, we just don't know what is truth and what is fiction anymore. And this is what happens when identity becomes solely a matter of individual truths, which don't exist, by the way. Truth isn't subjective. And of course, there are people who struggle with their body, who feel they have to present as the opposite sex, or even undertake painful and expensive surgery in order to have a chance at a happy life. And we've always been sympathetic and accommodating to such people. But with various governments around the world now changing their laws so that anyone can self-identify as whatever sex they like and gain access to women's only spaces, People are pointing out that this creates a loophole that is clearly open to exploitation. No one is saying that trans people are predators. They are saying that predators are predators and will use any means available to gain access to victims. It's already happened. Convicted sex offender Karen White, a male who identified as female, was transferred to New Hall Prison in West Yorkshire and went on to sexually assault two female inmates. And this is not an isolated incident, far from it. So it isn't transphobia to point out that identity politics in its current form has some serious consequences. I keep hearing that right-wing comedians only have one joke, and that's something to do with identifying as an attack helicopter. Actually, that's a seven-year-old online meme, and I've never heard any right-wing comedian use it as a punchline, but I understand why people pretend that they do. It's always much easier to at attack a straw man. But is that joke all that far from the reality? If activists are going to claim that identity is all about the choices one makes for oneself and that these should be implemented in law, then surely they have to include the trans Koreans, the trans disabled and the teacher with the immense prosthetic breasts. And this means we all have to live in a world in which we're constantly questioning our own judgments, where the lines of reality and satire are so blurred that we can never be sure where we stand. Now, that doesn't sound sensible to me. So rather than embrace the chaos of extreme identity politics, let's fight instead for the primacy of truth. Let's restore reason and objectivity and evidence-based analysis. Because you can't have a coherent society when the rules are being set by the fantasists. And my studio guests this evening are Leo Kurse and Sajila Kershey. <laughs> So, Leo, I'm going to come to you first as a, uh, as, as a young woman. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about this self-identity lar identity lark? What do you think about well, the this? Well, the guy uh, this, this week, or the woman who identifies as a disabled woman, I mean, that's, that's not new. People have been identifying as disabled in Scotland for years to claim <laughs> extra benefits. It's, uh, so this is just, it's part of your tradition? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like tartan. It's our culture. Yeah, yeah, it's your culture, absolutely. Yeah. What do you think, Sajid? I mean, look, Trans disabled? Do you think oh, this is right? Do you know? Don't, don't you know? As, as you know, on Twitter, I just lost my. I saw you were a bit. You yeah, were a I bit was angry. Really angry. I was so <laughs> livid because it's it's just gone too far. And then this week, I've also seen young girls like who go to women's toilets with men identifying as women or just making an effort by putting a bit of lippy on or. Uh, and it's like the old, you know, when women were taking the tiny little dogs? Yes. Like, literally, they are accessories. Right. And you're enabling this behaviour. And like, it's got to stop. It's ridiculous. But it's, it, it's, it's not going to stop, the way, is it? a great, great um, monologue, as always. But, uh, and, and so much to unpick. If you are disabled, I have, a, like, various disabilities which aren't visual. Yes. But I don't want them. I, I tried so hard to try and cover them up to sort of act normal. Uh, you wouldn't that, want to identify into disability, yeah, yeah, right? I, 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 I struggle to identify. I, I still struggle to say 
that I've got a disability. Yes. I find it hard to say that because I don't want that victimhood. I don't want... I want to be treated like I was before. And so... And, and disability is something that can happen to anyone. So, yeah. quite frankly, if he wants, I'm happy to drive over his leg back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> so he can get what... Or she can get what she wants. But this is getting absolutely ridiculous now. Yeah. And when I was young, I would have liked to identify as a young, blonde, white girl, right? Because that would have... Uh, like, because that was going to protect me from yep. the racism that I was getting. So that, uh, for me, was like the ideal. But no one would have accepted that. So why are we accepting someone now who wants to be basically just a victim and because they think that those protected characteristics or those protected groups are getting more well, attention than them? And, and it feels like, you know, it is becoming difficult to tell whether people are joking or whether they're not joking. I mean, if you take the Dylan Mulvaney example, I don't believe that's real. And yet he's just had an audience with the president of the USA. Yeah. So the president and the government in America clearly believe that it's real. Yeah. But watching that clip that I mean it's quite clear to me that I mean those are misogynist stereotypes so he's taking the piss isn't he isn't he I mean it, it seems like it but I mean you're not allowed to to say that you're literally not I've just allowed... said it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but I mean that, that saying like uh, misgendering him could could get you uh, like it's, it's being brought in as a crime in uh, Canada and I think other places as well are looking at it as but, a crime but Dylan Mulvaney is clearly a troll well, this is. This I mean, the I'm, thing. Not, I mean, I'm not wrong about this, am I? That's... She. I'm going to say she because I don't want to get. You know, I don't want a future SNP government reviewing this tape and saying. <laughs> <me to do. laughs> but she is at least putting in some effort. That a lot of them, like the the Karen White, who, who got sent to sent to the jail. Oh yeah. Like, people don't under self identification. You don't need to put any effort in whatsoever. I mean, the, uh, Karen White is need... particularly shocking because that's someone biologically intact male. Yeah. Convicted rapist and paedophile. Yeah. Actually went on to commit sexual assault in prison. And there's an incentive for people like that to, to transition because when you transition, you get a new name, you get a new identity. So right. then that masks your previous crimes. Yes. Uh, so How Gina, is that not like the witness protection program, but like, is that the new. Yeah, but, but helping out is that, a rapist. Like, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. the new witness protection program. What, what, it's ridiculous. Can I ask you, though, from a female perspective, seeing Dylan Mulvaney is a, th thinking that being a woman is being ditzy and falling over and being scared of. Flies. I mean, oh, is that not? I love it. I loved is all that, of that. Is that I not? Loved it, loved I mean, it, loved it. Is it not offensive? Oh I mean, god, it's 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 just. I mean, I don't know if that was a joke, right? I don't know whether that was a joke. <laughs> None of us do. However, it makes me really angry because I think what what we've done is we've collated everything together, like men who used to become transvestite just used to dress up as a woman. That's yes. a fetish. So that's been like all kind of come together under the same umbrella. So it's difficult to ascertain who is actually really legit. That's you know, the having, problem. Yeah, and, and so, therefore, it actually, what it's done is turned all of us against yeah. these these ideologies. It's, 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 it's actually it's made it making, harder for trans people. Yeah, it that's, is. That's and also, the thing. can I just point out that those men who identify as women, it is not easy being a woman. You cannot just wake up in the morning and say, I'm a woman. You haven't lived our experience. I know there, might, there might be a bug. Huh? There might be a dragonfly. There might be a dragonfly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is absolutely horrible. Well, listen, I'm going to stick my neck out and say that I think there's going to be a big reveal and Dylan Mulvaney is a troll. Really? And it's going to be... I think so. I'm going to, that, that's my prediction. Anyway, who can say? Let's get a couple of questions from our lovely audience. Our first question is from Rick. Rick, where are you? Hello, Rick. Yeah. Do carnivores deserve to live? <laughs> <laughs> OK, Rick's a little bit scary. Uh, this is uh, comments made by Oxford University academic Dr Michael Plant, which is a, veget <laughs> a vegetarian's name, if ever I heard one. He said, it can be ethical to let meat eaters die because of the suffering they've caused to animals. And uh, Dr Plant is a philosopher who focuses on happiness. Actually, he's not a vegetarian. He describes himself as a welfatarian which is someone who eats animals only if the creature experienced a happy life <laughs> prior to their death. I mean, how do you know that? Like, how do you assess whether a chicken is happy? Like, exactly. You... And, and how far do you take this? Do you only eat chickens that have uh, thrown themselves onto the butcher's knife? <laughs> or fallen out of trees. I don't understand it, but do you think he's got... I mean, look, to be fair, it was an Oxford University seminar of, in philosophy. Philosophers ask yeah. odd questions to explore ideas. I don't yeah. think he seriously means that, that yeah, it's OK to let carnivores again, die. Again, we shouldn't chastise him too much because uh, that would be restricting his free speech yes. to, to ask ridiculous questions. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think if we're going to look at animal welfare, we need to look at whales. Because uh, you kill one whale, you get enough meat for, like, you know, a hundred cows. So it's clearly more ethical to kill a whale. But there's no, hardly any whales left. No, there's loads of whales. Are you joking? We're not, we're not, Scotland doesn't even eat them anymore. 
There's so many whales. There's like two countries eating them. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, so ethically, you know, we should be killing a lot more whales than... Tequila's not sure. I don't like the idea of... <laughs> I don't like the idea of eating whales or dolphin-y type things. I don't really like... What do you make of this philosopher? Do you think it's fair enough? To, I mean, I think it's, it is just a philosophical question in a class. It's hypothetical. Yeah, I know, and he posed it in a very interesting way because he said that basically um, there was a dilemma one where you, if a child, a child is... ..to a low cost to yourself, like basically... Old, but your clothes get a bit mucky, yeah. right? Um, and then, uh, of course, if you are a, a, a animals, if for someone who's eating meat, would you say that? Well, I've, I've, I think what I do is now I would. Interesting. And, 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 You're very brutal tonight, Steve. <laughs> Why should I ruin my beef jerky? Well, this, yeah. this is like that philo philosophical question they often pose, which is, you know, if there's a burning building and you can either save the Mona Lisa or a baby, what do you do? What do you do there? You is there a way we can destroy? <laughs> now to another question. This is from Ivan. Ivan. Uh, yeah. Should we be worried about the far right in France? Down after 11 years, child, from what I can see. This guy, Jordan Bardella, he's the first person who isn't a member of the Le Pen family, uh, although he is sort of, I think he's... he's going out or he's, he's married out to with someone. Niece. Yeah, they do tend to keep it in the family, but um, but this is an interesting one, isn't it? So, I mean, he's got into trouble uh, for, for some sort of uh, indelicate things that he said about race and migration and that kind of thing. He's too young to... He's so, he is like an embryo. We're only seeing that because we're old. He's... Well, uh, Oh, yeah, but do you, do you think this means... Because, look, the Marine Le Pen, uh, first she changes the name of the Front National. Yeah. Uh, this is an attempt to, to, to make the party more appealing and more popular and more mainstream. Well, we've seen that happen uh, in Italy, in Sweden, you know, formerly, you know, quite objectionable far-right parties sort of clean up their image and, uh, and then do well in, in the polls. George and, Maloney, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. In, in Italy. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that could be an attempt at that. But what's interesting is, uh, you know, the stuff that he gets uh, chastised for um, is, is mostly common sense. And it's got to be seen in the context that France has had a huge amount of, uh, of immigration, has got a, a large... Uh, relatively large compared to the rest of Western Europe, you know, as of 2022, maybe 10 years' time it's going to be different. But a large uh, proportion of the population, 10 years' time it's going to be different, the Muslim. Right. And that hasn't been w without consequences. So the You can import a sort of a, what's basically from culturally distant parts of the world and expect it to just integrate perfectly in a Western liberal democracy. You've done well with Catholicism, to be honest, but there you go. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're blaming me for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for that. yeah uh, the thing is, obviously, uh, it's interesting because, yeah, there is a big immigration thing. And for, for, in France, it's because of our family there. Uh, in France, it's Algeria, um, uh, Morocco, yes. and uh, Tunisia. Interestingly enough, uh, Bardell is uh, his ancestry. He's a, a, a immigrant descent, Italian and Algerian, and he's he kind of joined the party when he was sixteen, but specifically for Le Pen. So he was kind of obviously attracted by her. So he's kind of almost been groomed all these is years. Is that part of the appeal I, of I him? Think, is that part I think of the it is. I think I, th I think it is because also they now get to use him. I, mean, you, I think you mentioned it yesterday. It's a bit like the uh, like the mafia. And if you remember the lawyer in the mafia, the lawyer was uh, you know he wasn't Italian, so he never quite fit in. And I think that's going to be Bardell's position. He's not quite a Le Pen, but he's going to be the tool that they're going to use well, I mean, to vote. votes. The party certainly did very well in the legislative elections earlier in the year, and they do seem to be gaining momentum. There's no doubt about that. Well, let's see what happens. Anyway, we've got another question now. This is from Ryan. Where is Ryan? Hello. Uh, good evening. Hello. Uh, will you pay £7 a month to have a blue tick on Twitter? <laughs> so, th so Elon Musk is causing so much problems at Twitter. You know, people are getting very, very upset. He's now saying that, you know, the blue check, which is the verified... Well, I mean, it was meant to be about verifying public figures so that you could distinguish between the public figures and the fake accounts and that so that sort of made sense but then twitter started a few years ago started basically seeing it as a hierarchical thing and sort of giving the blue ticks to their mates 
and you know, it, it didn't really mean anything anymore. I don't see why it's such a big deal for Twitter to charge for a service. I mean, that, that doesn't strike me as a big deal. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. they've got a huge uh, black hole in their budget to, yeah. to fill now. I mean, it's, it's a company that's always lost money. Uh, but interestingly, you've got a blue tick. Are you going to be paying that? You know, I do have a blue tick. Well, the reason why I think it wouldn't be such a bad idea is you're allowed to upload longer videos, for instance. And I'm right. always having to tr cut my videos in half. It's really annoying. Yeah. So actually, it would be worth it. So not, I think that's a good service. I don't see why anyone should begrudge paying not very much, but uh, oh, they put my blue tick up on the screen there. <laughs> That's me feeding a kangaroo in Australia. Oh, and you don't get any of the adverts either. So. And you don't get the adverts. Yes, I, don't, I just look, and these people who are complaining about it, eight dollars a month. I mean, come on. Yeah. They spend like more Netflix. than that on. Yeah, exactly. They spend more than that on Netflix. I don't, what do you think? My yeah. issue with it is, I mean, it's great. Like, it's a great way to, you know, like, it's a good idea to charge. Uh, I'm not going to be paying. I'm just going to go blue tickless, um, and because I don't really use it that much to make You're it, blue like, a difference. I'm, I'm not blue ticked. No. Oh, I think and, you're, because, because you're a film star. I'm a film star. Yeah, you be. I'm like proper diva now. Uh, yeah. Why? Yeah. Um, but I just think the problem I've got with it is that like all the trolls will pay their eight quid or seven quid a month and then get the blue ticks. And, yes, they and, will. But I sort of, I don't like the hierarchical thing. I don't like this idea that blue. T the way that blue tick people behave on Twitter, very much like lording it over other people and, and, and you know... Like, I, like, like me, <laughs> like me. <laughs> anyway, the final question for the moment is from Lyle. Where's Lyle? Uh, hello. Yeah, um, hello. Hi. Will Joe Biden become a lame duck president this week? OK, so this is the US midterms. Uh, this is all very exciting. And if the Democrats lose their majorities in the House of Representatives and the Senate, Biden will definitely struggle to pass any major legislation. And he's currently polling, by the way, worse than any president since the Second World War. Right. Wonder why that is. Trump. Yeah, why yeah. is that? Well, I mean, he's not doing a very good job. If you look That'll at, be it. Yeah, if you look at the, <laughs> the prices of everything, there's there's rampant inflation. Gas prices are, are skyrocketing. Well, they, yeah. they've come down a little bit, but uh, but yeah, he's, he's just not delivering as a as a president. And uh, he seems to have allied himself with the the real sort of extremist radical far left of the which was Democrat weird party. because he was elected on the base of not being the woke candidate. Yeah, that was why people went for him. Yeah, rather than you know uh, Kamala Harris or, yeah. the, or people like that. And bizarrely, uh, the Democrats. Uh, I saw a speech by Obama. Yesterday, they're making a democracy, the, the, the defense of democracy is their sort of main platform. And Obama's saying, you know, if you care about democracy, the Republicans don't respect democracy. They, they tried to, uh, you know, discount the results of the election and all yeah. this sort of stuff. But it wasn't. It wasn't completely no. valid, factually. Republicans who, who denied the results of the 2006. really been anti-democratic. I think both sides are... Well, I think both, of course both sides have problems. Uh, Sajina, very quickly, because we've got to go to break. I think, I, 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 think, think, I think the midterms are a really great idea, and I wish that we would take on board some of that and, like, you know... Yeah. I forget midterm. It's like, how many you know, prime ministers do we need to get through before we have <laughs> yeah. any kind of <laughs> we, say in a who, who we gets could, to lead our country? We could do with a mandate right now, yeah, we couldn't could. we? Definitely. We could. Well, look, after the break on Free Speech Nation, we're going to be speaking to the Liberal Democrat who is facing deselection because of his Christian beliefs. See you shortly. Woo! Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun. Every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Every Saturday at two o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. <laughs> Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. Great nation. Find its voice. We're Absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On radio and online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. A Christian who is hoping to become a Liberal Democrat MP at the next election is facing deselection because of his religious beliefs. David Campanali was chosen to stand as the Lib Dem candidate in Sutton and Cheam at the next election, but he will find out tomorrow whether or not he's been deselected. The events of the last few months have led to David Campanali being let go from his job at a PR firm. And David joins me now. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Can you give us some background to this? Because my understanding of the Liberal Democrats is that it's, it's a broad church, so to speak. It's, 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 where, it's a place where people can have any religion or none. Uh, they're called, well, the clue's in the name, the Liberal Democrats. So what's going on here? That's exactly right. So the Liberal Democrats are an inclusive party and we welcome everybody, regardless of background, regardless of faith, whether they're trans, whether they're same sex. Um, it doesn't matter. You're all welcome to be in the Liberal Democrats. The difficulty is that not a, that message isn't always embraced by everybody. And in this particular constituency, Sutton and Cheam, the activists, since I was selected at the beginning of the year, said, now that we know that you hold Christian beliefs, um, we don't want to deliver your leaflets. But you weren't hiding these beliefs, were you? I wasn't hiding them. And I stood for the Liberal Democrats against Kwasi Kwarteng in 2019 in the last general election and trebled the vote because I'm a successful campaigner. Um, I raise issues of international injustice and I'm committed to making sure that the government are held to account. Now, the party knew that. That's why I was selected with one of the biggest turnouts in a selection for a Liberal Democrat parliamentary uh, seat. So the members support me, but um, the way in which council culture works, the moment a problem is identified, they really go for you. So, so it's a core group of activists within the yeah. party. Uh, now, I've read an account of what happened. It sounds very much like they called you in for a bit of an inquisition. Is this what happened? So that's right. So when people discovered that I hold uh, Christian beliefs, I was called to a meeting of about 30 people, 30 activists. And it was things like, well, if we'd known, you should have put your beliefs in your election literature. You should have described to us your background as a Christian activist. 
Um, these weren't things that I'd hidden, I, neither am I ashamed of them. Um, I think that the Liberal Democrats embrace all people of faith and uh, they protect minority rights. It's absolutely forefront in what we believe in. But for these individuals, they didn't seem to extend it to people of faith. So the sorts of things that they were saying uh, were, we do not recognise your right to a conscience. I had that in a private conversation. Somebody rang me. They said that uh, you are religious, we are rational. We are building a secular party. Now, the Liberal Democrats are not a secular party. Um, as I keep emphasising, our, our uh, whole ethos is um, underpinned by uh, religious worldviews. I mean, on my own inspiration of people like Tim Farron and Simon Hughes, people in the past like Charles Kennedy, our former party leader, and Shirley Williams, who are both pro-life Christians. And when I mentioned that to explain my own story, my own journey in politics, they said, well, Charles Kennedy, Shirley Williams, they're both dead, they're the past, we're building a secular party. Just to be clear, who are these people exactly and what is their role within the party? So we're talking about activists um, who might be standing for um, local election, we're talking about party officers. One said, you pulled the wool over, my, over our eyes. So they sort of got together in a kind of group. Well, I don't and know about you. that. that what... Well, it was certainly I was summoned um, at somebody's house for the, what was a a kangaroo court. I mean, they really went for me. This was a kind of lynch mob. I, I'm still in a state of shock that this can happen bizarre. in politics um, today. It's very odd because I mean, surely, I mean, we've had this before with Tim Farron, of course, Tim Farron, who was leader of the Liberal Democrats, yeah. and that he had a lot of flack. Uh, for his uh, Christian beliefs. Now, he made the point, he made the case that he wasn't going to start applying his own views about, say, abortion or homosexuality to uh, official Liberal Demo Democrat Party policy. Is that the way that you would go? Yes, yeah, so the way it works is that if you're elected as a, a member of parliament for any party um, on issues of conscience, that, they, that is to say the party doesn't place a whip, you're allowed to follow your conscience. So right. um, that's the key point. It's, I wouldn't be imposing my views on the party. What I, all I asked for was the space to allow on those non-whipped issues to pursue my conscience. So obviously I'm out campaigning for the Liberal Democrat Manifesto today. Our party leader, Sir Ed Davies, made a very powerful speech holding the government to account. We're determined to see the back of this government and I just want to be able to get on and campaign. I just want to emphasise that even if um, this vote goes against me tomorrow, um, I will appeal and I'm confident that because we are this inclusive party um, that I will win on appeal. Can you clarify for us what their fear is about you standing for, the, for Parliament? Well, they've never said. So at no time in writing have I been told what the problem is. There's the returning officer for this deselection process in writing in advance told the officers of the party, I can see no basis in David's performance for you, no grounds in it for you to be doing this. Uh, Sir Simon Hughes, who uh, was 35 years a Liberal Democrat MP in London, um, himself a Christian, um, pleaded, he, he went along to this meeting last Tuesday and he represented me and he, he pleaded with the members. He said, you know, you can't deselect somebody because they have personal and private beliefs. You know, that isn't what Liberals do. And he said, let's, let's pause, let's have mediation, let's do the sensible thing, let's have an investigation. And people started shouting at him. Well, I think this is a major problem and why the popularity of the Lib Dems has gone down, I feel. I mean, firstly, you had the, uh, the approach to Brexit, which was let's just right, run roughshod over this. But you're called the Liberal Democrats. That doesn't feel very democratic. And then you've got issues like this which don't feel very liberal. Well, I let's mean, be don't, should the party change its name? Let's be absolutely clear that the Liberal Democrats have no, are a Liberal Party, we are a Democratic Party, that what we are seeing in just this corner of London is an aberration. This is not representative of who we are. Sir Edward Davey, the party leader, before he was selected by our members to be leader, he gave an interview in the tablet, which is a Catholic magazine, and he said that there is a, a, a wave of international intolerance amongst progressive parties and Liberal parties but I guarantee to fight for rights of conscience of my MPs. Ed Dave is a churchgoer himself. He's an Anglican like myself, uh, like me, with, with his family. And I know that he, will, he is building an inclusive party. He's holding the government to account. And this is an appalling distraction from the Liberal Democrat campaign. I mean, these activists are acting in complete defiance of the party. It's an appalling distraction and I, ho and I hope and fully expect that they will be held to account. Is, is it the case that if, it strikes me that this seems to be the way it often goes with these sorts of 
well, they describe themselves as progressive activists. I don't think they are particularly progressive. But they just infiltrate, and in small in number, but they have so much clout. It, whenever they go in, in, whether that be corporations, the Labour Party certainly has uh, seems to be held hostage by well, of course, small groups. I mean, the Labour Party have had their problems with militant in Liverpool and under firm leadership. Uh, Neil Kinnock dealt with them. And then, of course, momentum and anti-Semitism was addressed successfully by Keir Starmer. And, of course, I think what we're seeing here in this, this small group, unrepresentative of, of who we are as a party, is actually a terrific opportunity for the Liberal Democrats to show and embrace the kind of party we really are, for um, the internal mechanisms of the party who ought to be allowed to get on and deal with this particular issue, um, to demonstrate that we are not the party that these people are trying to turn us into being. Mm. So I'm absolutely confident that under Ed Davies' leadership, that these, you know, he's made it very clear he doesn't want US style culture wars coming to this country. It would be a disaster yes. if identity politics was to dominate the public narrative. For Liberal Democrats, we're concerned about the NHS. That's why today, as a, uh, in Ed's speech, he's promised to make sure that everyone get, gets access to see a GP when they need it, that he'll recruit 8,000 more doctors for the NHS by rolling out a training programme to make sure that people get the care that they need. But all of this won't ma mean much if all, all this distracting stuff is going on. I mean, can I, you It's just a small distraction. But, but, I mean, let's be absolutely but you've, clear. But you've been let go by your PR firm, haven't you? Well, look, I mean, I've left... I, I've had 10 months of hell. I mean, I'm, I spent 30 years as an award-winning journalist in BBC News um, for the television arm of the World Service. I was the journalist here. I mean, I won in the BBC News Awards of last year, exclusive of the year. I've been, I was nominated by the BBC for a, a Royal Television Society Award. I came second globally, or runner-up, for news report of last year for exposing the rape and torture of Muslim women in the Xinjiang camps, along with my correspondent colleague and an online writer. So I've surrendered that career to fight for integrity and justice in politics. And what this group uh, have, have attempted to do is to rob the voters of Sutton and Cheam. There are, there are set over 70,000 voters in Sutton and Cheam, and there were 70 people last uh, last Tuesday night, yeah. who were deciding the future of who they could vote yeah. for. Uh, completely anti-democratic uh, behaviour. Uh, uh, well, I, I believe that, they're, that Christians and people of faith should be allowed to express their faith in the public square. This is why it's free speech. So free, what... It should be a free speech nation. And I, I, I think pe the message needs to be clear. Some people are Christian. Get over it. Yep. OK, well, we've got to wrap up now, but... What next for you? What, do, what would, you, would you like people to do to help? Well, if you'd like to help me uh, make sure that there is freedom of speech in the public square, back my crowdfunding campaign, because I want to look and see whether I can have legal options. The Equalities Commission um, have given a guide to political parties that say you have to take harassment seriously, and I want to use that guidance to hold activists to account for the kind of intolerant behaviour that they've shown. And that uh, website is there on the screen as we talk. Well, uh, David Campanali, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. After the break of Free Speech Nation, I'll be discussing whether there ought to be a statue of Queen Elizabeth II in Trafalgar Square. See you in a few moments. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. And later in the show, I'm going to be turning agony uncle with the help of my wonderful panel, Leo Kurse and Sajila Kershey. And we're going to help you deal with your unfiltered dilemmas. So if you've got any problems in your personal or professional life, just email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk and we will do our very best to answer your issues. Here's a question for you. Should there be a statue of Queen Elizabeth II in Trafalgar Square? Following her death in September, it was suggested that a statue of the UK's longest reigning monarch should be put on the empty fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. However, Mayor of London Sadiq Khan has ruled it out for the foreseeable future. Since 1999, the plinth has been used to show a number of contemporary artworks. So to discuss this issue and a number of related matters is the philosopher and psychologist Dr. Peter Hughes, who also wrote a book, A History of Love and Hate in 21 Statues. Welcome to the show. Right, to be here. So, Peter, let's talk about the, this plinth first, because you wrote the yeah. article for the New Statesman about this idea about whether or not the Queen should get that place on that plinth. Yeah. How do you feel about it? Should she be there? Well, it's a complex issue, because the issue I was trying to tackle here was was the one about whether you ought to have a better place for the Queen, for instance, like yes. Simon Heffer suggested. He said, no, he said, the fourth plinth is not a good enough place for the Queen. She ought to be, have a much grander stage than the fourth plinth. So she's overshadowed by, by, so uh, by Nelson. She, overshadowed by yeah. Nelson. Yeah. Which, incidentally, I mean, for those who don't know the history of the fourth plinth, not so long ago it was suggested that Mrs Thatcher ought to be on the fourth plinth so that yes. Nelson could keep an eye on her. Oh, OK, yeah. fair <laughs> enough. And that's coming from Simon Heffer, a right-leaning yeah, commentator. Right, so, yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of people have said that the, the 
artwork that has been displayed on the fourth plinth has largely been activist artwork. And certainly there has been a trend of that, hasn't there? There has been a trend of activist artwork. So, for example, the, the current occupant of the fourth plinth is, is John Chalembwe, who, was, uh, uh, who fought against colonial rule in Nyasaland in, in, uh, in 1915. But his motivations, to say the least, were complex. And he was a very complex character because it's debatable whether his purity of motive really was not contaminated by his own financial difficulties. But, mm. And in 2024, the plinth is due to give way to 850 faces of, of transgender people. So clearly there's an activist vein in this. Yes. Um, but I think that, that what's very interesting is the very, the very first, very first uh, thing to be put on the plinth was something called Eke Homo by, uh, by a, a sculptor. And it was really a, a picture of the crucified Jesus, a life-size sculpture. And, and it, it wasn't glorified in any way. It wasn't very ornate. It wasn't Baroque. It was a really simple piece. And all he wanted to get across was here's a simple man just being lynched by the mob, just being handed over to the mob. Yes. Uh, w which, of course, gives over, really, to, to, to so many issues that we have around both the death of the Queen, the fourth plinth, the issue of colonialism. Yeah, I mean, they should, in a way, it would resonate more to bring that statue back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I would, I would rather like to see some, just some decent art as yeah. opposed to a big uh, image of whipped cream with a fly on yeah, it, which I was mean, just an eyesore. Yeah, some of it's been a complete eyesore. Yeah. You know, and in one, one instance, I think, by Anthony Gormley, 2,400 members of the public spent an hour each standing on the plinth. Well, you know, I don't particularly want to watch 2,400 no, <laughs> members of the public It's a long time to enjoy a work of art. It's a long time. So, yeah. so um, but this is a very... I mean, it's interesting that these yeah. things become weaponised yeah. within the culture war, don't they? But they yeah. always do it whenever we talk about statues coming up or coming down yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And you've written this book. Uh, um, do you want to tell us a bit about the book? Yeah, it's a history of love and hate in 21 statues. And it, it traces the history of violent statue destruction from uh, 1,300 BC and the, the greatest queen of the ancient world, Hatshepsut, right? through to Edward Colston and Frederick Douglass and the Confederate monuments in the modern day. So it's three and a half thousand years of history. And, and it's a depressing history because we don't realise sometimes how thin the line is between not just the burning of books and the killing of people, but the destruction of statues and the killing of people. And, and, and I'll give you an example, which is really a really good mirror of where we are really as a culture now, which was in 1966, at the dawn of the Cultural Revolution, not long after the first teacher had been killed in an elite private school in Beijing. She'd been clubbed to death and, and, a, and a body thrown in, in some sort of trash cart at yes. an elite school, mind you, and that has real strong resonances with what's going on today. And, uh, and we had 10 years of uh, more than 10 years of a cultural revolution which sought to destroy everything that came before, old ideas, old habits, old customs, all ha They went and got the statue of the Red Guards, went into the confusion... ...streets, put a dunce's cap on his head and cast it into the flames. Yeah. That is where statue destruction can lead. And, and there's one thing that was really noticeable around the death of the Queen, and this is where it comes into the broader culture ways. There was a Carnegie Mellon professor called Uju Anya who said, I, may the Queen, she said, die in unspeakable pain. I remember this. It was a tweet, wasn't it? Was it was a tweet, a number of tweets. May she die in agony. May her suffering be unspeakable. And, and this really cuts to the heart of the psychology of what we're dealing with yes. when we're dealing with the culture wars. Well, this is the thing about cancel culture, is really at the heart of it is vengeance. And it's very easy to destroy and less easy to create. And there is, there's something about, even when you see the mobs in, in Bristol tearing down the statue of Edward Colston, we can all agree that the slave trade was a great evil, yeah. right? But there was something about the relish and the joy of the mob yeah. that was ultimately disturbing, irrespective of the target. Yeah, yeah and, and that's where the psychology comes in, because people assume that empathy and cruelty are opposites, but they're not. Mm. If you have strong empathy towards an in-group, you are likely to sanction all manner of unmentionable cruelties towards an out-group. Yes. And, and which is why, for example, when you see a tweet like the one sent by Uju Anya, or see a tweet like, um, I hope you die in hell, I hope you rot in hell, hashtag empathy, or yes. hashtag be kind, people assume there's a conflict between those two halves of the tweet, but there's no, not. No, well, I've learned very much from being on Twitter too much yeah. that there isn't a conflict, that, that actually some of the people who claim to be the kindest and most benevolent people yeah. are actually among the most vicious Absolutely. and the most bullying. But I've seen this again and again, and you mentioned the, the thin line between burning books and burning people. Yeah. 
the famous Heinrich Hein quotation yeah. about, you know, where, where they burn books, they will in yeah. the end burn people too. And I remember an interview with Cat Stevens, who had, who had um, yeah. converted to Islam, and he was on a, an Australian TV pro program after the fatwa. Yeah. And he was talking about people burning effigies of Salman Rushdie, and he was asked, would you go and see an effigy of Salman Rushdie burnt? And he said, I would rather it was the real thing. Yeah. And it that. does feel sometimes in these situations that people do. They, they, that frenzy, they do feel, that, that it feels like a yeah. scary yeah. mob. Well, th this, this explains basically the different attitude you have towards suffering between our in-group and our out-group. Let me take you back to 1895, the incarceration of the great writer Oscar Wilde in Reading Jail. Mm. And, and he was incarcerated in solitary confinement for gross indecency, but the reality was it was for his homosexuality. And he was locked up for 23 hours a day, and one hour a day, one hour a day, he was allowed to walk around in silence the prison yard. And one day, one of the other prisoners comes up to him and says, Sir, 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 um, people like me, poor working class lad like me, we expect this, it's our destiny, it's our fate, but you, sir, your suffering must be so much greater than mine because you've fallen from such a great height. And Oscar Wilde turned to him and said, No, he said, we all suffer alike. And, and, and latterly, the famous <coughs> rabbi, Harold Krishna, who, who wrote, when bad things happen to good people, said, we are all brothers and sisters in suffering. The philosopher uh, uh, Schopenhauer suggested we address each other not as Mr and Mrs or Frau or Fraulein or Madame or Monsieur, but as my fellow sufferer. But what happens in the culture wars, what happens is we learn contempt and we learn to create a hierarchy of suffering. So those whose suffering, who's suffering I can identify with, I will empathise with that. But if you do not believe what I do, if you do not think the way that I do, if you do not look the way that I do, if you don't hold the same beliefs that I do, then I will mock your suffering. Yes. And, 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 and that's what's so symbolic that the fourth plinth began with a figure of Jesus Christ, I say this as an atheist, who was simply standing there, just an ordinary man being handed over to the mob. And how many ordinary people are being handed over today to the mob? Absolutely. I think it's the inhumanity of the culture wars that's most it's disturbing. absolutely it. right. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. Thank you. And after the break, I'll discuss the latest hate crime statistics, which showed a 26% increase in a year. Don't go anywhere. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. On The Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with The Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me 
noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So, there has been a 26% increase in the number of hate crimes recorded by police in England and Wales. The figures show that in the 12-month period up to March this year, more than 155,000 hate crimes were recorded by the 43 police forces in England and Wales. 70% of the crimes were racially motivated. But are we really facing an epidemic in hate crimes? To discuss these figures and look at the broader issue, I'm joined by the deputy editor of Spiked, Fraser Myers. So, it seems that every year we get these reports that say uh, hate crimes are on the, on the rise. Every single year this... Every single year the report will say crime is on the rise and it will usually be a huge gap. Like, t you know, 26% yeah. is a huge jump. So these figures sound very scary. Um, it would sound like hatefulness is on the rise. But when you dig a bit, bit down deeper into it, it's, it's clear that this isn't true. There isn't really a rise in hate know crime this? at all. Because there are several different methods for um, essentially recording hate crime. Um, this particular method, the police recorded version, goes up every year, almost uncontrollably. Whereas there's another version called the Crime Survey for England and Wales, and that has shown pretty consistently that hate crime has been falling. It's fallen by about 40% in the past 10 years. And actually, that's what you'd expect, because Britain is becoming a more tolerant country. You know, we're certainly not more racist, more homophobic uh, this year. We're not, are we 25% more racist this year than we were <laughs> yeah. last year? I mean, it's an absurdity. <coughs> so these statistics really are the consequence of changes in the recording method, and police forces are essentially encouraged to go out and find, you know, instances of hate crime. Well, Everyone is encouraged to come forward and report hate crime well, we've a lot seen more this, than other crimes. We've seen this on Twitter a lot, where police mm. say, you know, if, if someone has said something offensive to you or upsetting to you, then please get in touch. Yeah. So it's that kind of trawling. But also, you know, it's, it seems as though the criteria for what qualifies as a hate crime has changed so that it's all about the perception of, of, a, of a victim rather than a complainant. That's right. In terms of what is actually recorded by the police, it should be that it's, it's something is hateful if it's hateful according to perception of the victim or any other person. So any right. other person could decide that an incident was hateful and then it could be recorded in the figures. That works slightly differently when you're, you know, charging someone or when you're putting someone in prison for a hate crime. Yes. But in terms of the police recording, it's all about perception. What is the incentive for these changes? When, when did this all start? So it really kicks off in 2014 when the College of Policing, who <coughs> train uh, police officers, changed their guidance to put in this uh, rule about perception. But they also suggested that it would be a failure if the police are recording less hate crime. Essentially, that should not be the goal of the police. Was that explicitly very... stated? It, it was explicitly stated that there should not be targets at reducing hate crime figures, which is bizarre. So they want hate crimes they to They want on the to rise. be able to record hate crimes because they believe that there's this hidden epidemic, that people were not coming forward, and now, finally, you know, the truth is, is, is being revealed. Now, re in reality, what's happened is that um, people are being encouraged to come forward, as you suggest. The police are not only, you know, advertising the fact that you should report hate crime on social media, they're going around in vans. You may have seen this van in the Wirral um, a couple of years ago that said, being offensive is an offence. You know, telling people to report nasty tweets to them. Yes. Um, and it's not even clear that a nasty tweet is necessarily a crime, which is... But you know, why? Confusing. What is the incentive here? Because, you know, there are still hateful crimes yeah. going on, right? So we need to have an accurate sense of where, how, how much that's actually happening, don't we? I think there is just this broader prejudice in the police, you know, in 
you know, I guess you could say, among the establishment that Britain really is a hateful country. And so they see, even though it's clearly the statistics make no sense, they see this as a reflection of fact and, of, you know, they see it as a reflection of all the hard work they're doing. But all of the studies that show that Britain is one of the least racist countries in the world. Well, exactly. You know, that's why that's why it's so at odds with, you know, most people's experience of the world. That's why these statistics are, are so absurd. And this year it's been, uh, they're saying that the particular leap is, a, is transgender hate crime. Yeah. And yet when you dig down into the actual uh, stats and the attacks on trans people, mm. very, very rare. It's, it's incredibly rare. And in fact, uh, Channel 4, of, of all people, strikingly, once did a sort of fact-checking on transgender hate crime. And they realised that actually if you're, you're statistically less likely to be attacked as a trans person than the average person. So the idea that, you know, trans people are facing all this targeting and, and um, you know, violent crime is, is not quite accurate. So when it comes to the College of Policing, so they introduced all this in 2014. Yeah. And they also introduced this idea of rep recording non-crime. Can you tell us a bit about that? So this is, so a non-crime hate, hate incident is even more surreal because where a hate crime can be hateful based on the perception of someone, you can have a non-crime incident that's not even a crime. So this right. is where you're really talking about the most minute events, you know, people having arguments um, with neighbours and things like that, or there have been hate crimes or non-crime hate incidents recorded where someone has beeped someone in a car aggressively. There's been people campaigning for Brexit who have been reported for non-crime hate incidents. So even political there's opinions, been, yeah, right. There's been, there's been suspicious dog poos on the neighbour's lawn and, someone's, and that, those have been reported as non-crime hate And they go into the incident. stats of hate? Well, they're not supposed to, but it has been shown that some police officers are putting them into the stats. And non-crime hate incidents were found to be unlawful by the High Court in the recent case of Harry Miller and the Home Office instructed the College of Policing to stop doing it, and it seems like they haven't. They haven't. It, it carries on. So the, the, the College of Policing have updated their guidance to say that, you know, you shouldn't pursue cases that are irrational, um, that police officers should have a bit more wits about them in terms of what they record. But the fact is that many of the actions that have been taken, you're right, that, you know, last year Priti Patel said that all non-crime hate incidents should be wiped from people's records. Yes. But people were still finding, you know, if they did an enhanced DBS check, that they would have a non-crime hate incident. But that's the problem, isn't it? Their name. That there are consequences. If you're applying for a job, a teacher or something, maybe yep. working with children, and a DBS check comes, a disclosure and barring service check, yep. comes up with a non-crime hate incident, well, maybe the employer won't hire you. Exactly. And you might not even know that you have this incident logged against your name. Right. You know, and let's, let's also step back a bit. The, the College of Policing is a quango. It's a private limited company. And yes. it, it essentially just drew up this quasi-law out of nothing, out of its new guidance for police officers. So how did it get away with that? And how did it get away ignoring the judiciary in the Home Office? I think that the pressure on, um, from within the police and from, with, from within the you know, civil service, from with our, within our institutions, is to you know, constantly push in a more kind of woke, politically correct direction. And so it does mean that they end up ignoring the courts, ignoring politicians, ignoring even some, a lot of um, high-ranking police officers think a lot of this stuff is silly and there's got to be um, contained. But that's anti-democratic. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, right. what, so what do we do about it? I mean, isn't there a case for just shutting down the College of Policing? That's what I'd do. <laughs> that, that could be one solution. I think that we need to raise awareness of the fact that hate crime is not what people think it is. So you yeah. might imagine a kind of uh, violent attack, the kind of thing that we would all uh, deplore. But often it is, you know, really a question of spats on Facebook. Yeah, uh, offensive jokes. Offensive kind of jokes. Thing. And you can, you can see that the, the recording of it is actually very bad, but you can see at least 50% uh, of the hate crimes are so-called public order offences. Even many of the ones that are tagged as violent on the police's um, database actually happened online. So are they really violent? I, I, that's a... but, but, but even if there's a violent crime, why should the uh, private feelings of the person who committed the crime come into account? Why not just apply the law on the basis of the crime committed? I think that's right. I think that, you know, the the idea of hate crime takes us down this slippery slope to thought control. Mm. You know, a crime is, is surely evil, regardless of what, is ha what is the person is thinking in their head at the time they commit it. Yeah, very interesting. OK, well, Fraser Myers, thanks for joining me tonight. Thanks, I'm with you until 9 o'clock this evening. There's a new show on GB News tomorrow morning, and here's what you can expect. Monday on GB News. Join my new show, Bev Turner Today, from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all.
on radio and online. And let's get some questions that have been emailed to us over the last few days. So our first question was emailed in from Rasheen, and it is, is Gary Neville a hypocrite? OK, so this was uh, following the Manchester United footballer's appearance on Have I Got News For You on Friday, ex-footballer, I should say. And Neville presented the show, and he was absolutely grilled by Ian Hislop over his decision to work for the Qatar State Broadcaster during the World Cup. Uh, now, in the past, Neville has criticised the country for its approach to workers and women's rights, as well as attitudes towards LGBT people. But here's what happened a couple of nights ago. Ian, is it coming home? What, your reputation? <laughs> <laughs> um, the others have been very gentle with you, Gary, but, well, I thanks, mean... Thanks, Ian. The elephant in the room is still there. I mean, you're, you're commentating there, aren't you? Yeah, I'm commentating there. And what's the defence? Football term. We're commentating there. <laughs> well, you've got a choice, I think, haven't you? What, going or not going? Well... <laughs> my view always has been that you either highlight the issues and challenges in these countries and speak about them, or you basically don't say anything and you stay back home and don't go. And I've always said we should challenge There's them. There's another option. You stay at home and highlight the abuses. You don't have to go and take the Qataris' money. Yeah. That's pretty brutal. Sajila, so, what do you feel about that? Do you think that's fair? Uh, I think he knows what he got himself into. He's obviously never watched the show. Yeah, like, really. You know, you know you're going to get, like, roasted on that. Um... OK, so I, I did initially think, like, don't go, like, that's where you make a stance. Yeah. But I'm actually changing my mind because I realised that we didn't know about all the issues with Qatar when... The, I remember all the three years ago we had, like, um, the prince... One of the princes, William, had gone over. And, um, I mean, obviously I've known from personal experience from going over there what, what it's like, but uh, we didn't really know. And so once it was in place that they're going to play football there, it's in place. However... But they knew about the anti-gay laws and they knew about the truth. They, yeah, they would have not, but it wasn't made a big deal in the public. So now everyone's speaking out because it's, it's actually made more public. But I still think they've got a chance to turn this around. So if they go over there, what I want to see is I want to say... I want to see rainbow kits. I want to see a rainbow... A tsunami of rainbow in the They're in not the going to do that, though, yeah. are they? I want to hear Katy Perry kiss a girl. Uh, <laughs> I want to hear uh, George Michael, you know, outside. I want to hear Electric Six gay bar played on a loop uh, around and around and well, around. Well, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's passive-aggressive ways to do this. There are, this. indeed, and yeah. I, would, I would support that because I think, you know, there's a lot of time spent wearing... flying the rainbow flag over here where we've already got equal rights and it yeah. doesn't achieve anything. Yeah. But in these sort of countries, they just don't yeah. tend to do that, do they? Uh, Leo, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah. I mean, Gary Neville says uh, that he's he's going to change it from within. He's he's going to he's going to collaborate, and you know, when he's over there, he's going to he's going to try and change it. But it's a nonsense. There's an obvious conflict of interest by taking you know hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not millions. I know David Beckham is being paid something like 150 million pounds. Okay, but there are ways that you can like uh, Harry Kane. Apparently, the captain is going to be wearing a rainbow armband oh, while he's over there. Apparently, uh, while he's uh, while he's working for a regime that literally have the death penalty for homosexuals. I mean, it's an absolute nonsense. It just exposes the complete self-serving lie of this sort of woke virtue signalling. Like, to be taking the knee for Black Lives Matter in a stadium where, where hundreds of slaves died building it, and to be wearing a rainbow armband in a, in a country where, where uh, homosexual people can be executed or imprisoned, that's an absolute nonsense. Is it not nonsense. the case, Sajida, that they just shouldn't have chosen this location oh my for God, the World Cup? Oh, my God, they never should have. I don't know where... I don't know... There is, there's got to be, like, a fallout from this of what actually happened and why we went there and what yeah. who was getting paid what. Because this, this is very, very fishy. OK, well, our next question now is from Rose. And Rose says, Are modern updates of Shakespeare going too far? So this will be about uh, the bosses of the Icarus Theatre in London. They cancelled this production of Romeo and Juliet. And this was due to be set in Nazi Germany with non-binary leads. Uh, so Romeo and Juliet, non-binary. And Romeo was to be depicted as a member of the Hitler Youth and Juliet as a persecuted Jew. Uh, however, the casting call asked for non-binary artists and or those of global majority black or Asian heritage uh, and didn't invite Jewish people to uh, apply 
it was a mess, right? It's an <laughs> big identitarian <laughs> yeah. mess. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's interesting the language that uh, that's being used now to describe uh, what previously would be minority. Now it's global majority, which is actually sort of revealing the fact that you know these people aren't minorities, whereas Jewish people are a genuine minority. I think there's 14 or 15 million Jews in the world, uh, which is you know a tiny like Kanye West has got twice as many followers on Twitter. <laughs> so uh, but this is but I, but I don't understand what they're doing with the play here. I mean, it, it seems very boring to me actually to make it about non-binary issues and things like that. It sounds like that's what everyone's doing. That's what every play, no matter what it is, yeah. at every theatre seems to be addressing. And they think they're really radical and edgy. Yeah. It's, just, it's banal. It's just the law now. You've got it's to, the law. You've got to have all this, <laughs> uh, you know, anything non-binary, trans. I mean, these, and these things are basically meaningless. But I mean, like, because anybody can be trans, anybody can be non-binary. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't actually mean anything. But, but they've always they've sort of done uh, sort of things with Shakespeare and sort of updated like King Lear on a council estate or whatever you want to do. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with that. That's artistic freedom. But then you had the Joan of Arc play at the Globe recently where Joan was non-binary. Yeah. So they, they, they decided that because uh, she was such a sort of independent, strong woman, she couldn't have actually been a woman. Uh, so they made her non-binary. Yeah. It was quite a sort of misogynistic idea behind it. Don't you find, Sajina, that the constant... I don't, I don't, so don't go to the theatre now because I'm fed up with being lectured. Mm. Right? It's just constant lecturing about identity issues. Isn't it a bit boring? It is. I mean, I, I mean, it's a very different thing from telling on stories, like telling own stories. I mean, OK, Romeo and Julia, I kind of get it. I mean, I remember doing, uh, like, interfaith stuff um, with a Jewish-Muslim uh, collaboration, and we did, like, uh, you know, a Palestinian girl falling in love with, a, you know, a, a, an Israeli uh, soldier. Right. And, OK, that's that. I can see that. But really, you did not put a casting call out for a Jewish actor when that is the primary like concern here and yet of, because the language has got so like we have to include everybody and every casting I get it's always like uh, we're looking for non-binary and trans it's but it's like, not there's like not that many actors out there <laughs> you know, no. it's like stop coming into my casting kind of like category I, I just really but if you it. limit the casting role to non-binary people then you're limiting uh, who, who could apply for the yeah. role and you won't yeah. get the best person for the role right no you won't, you just won't. it's not like non-binary people have this sort of magical acting ability well thank yeah, but god no, but luckily, luckily acting's really easy you just put on the clothes they give you yeah. and you pretend to yeah. be the person. That's it. There That's might be more to it than that, uh, Leo. But it, is, it, it does feel a bit weird that, you know, this was a play... They decided to make it about issues relating to Jewish people and they didn't invite Jewish people to apply? Yeah. I mean, that... that well, I mean, it's dodgy, right? But according to the tenets of wokeism, they haven't set a foot wrong. So the, the tenets of wokeism say you've got to prioritise non-binary, trans, global majority. Uh, and Jewish people aren't seen as in that sort of protected, one of those protected characteristics. Right. Jewish people are, are seen, uh, you know, we're almost as low down, Jewish people are almost as low down in the, uh, the sort of progressive pyramid as, as white people. So... I I this stuff to be, I mean, like I say, boring, ultimately boring. And yeah. I just want well, people it's a play. It's going to be boring. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you are a Philistine, though. I I'm mean, not. You I, just, <laughs> I just, I have What's realized, the last book you read? I have, what, 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 did you ride a horse to work? I mean, <laughs> technology moves on. We get virtual reality. We get, like, you know... I would prefer to ride a horse to work. I'd like to ride a horse there to work go. as well. That's going to be our it's, goal. Does it identify as a horse, though? That's a very good question. <laughs> I'm going to move on to another question. This is from Alyssa. Alyssa says, should the Welsh football teams be allowed to change their names? OK, now, I don't know anything about uh, football, but apparently the Football Association of Wales could change its na the name of the national teams to Cymru, which is the Welsh word for Wales. So should they do that, Leo? Because, I mean, well, what is it? It's roughly half of the Welsh population are Welsh-speaking... Mm. Is that fair to... to, to whereas 100% of them are English-speaking. Yeah. So, I mean... Uh, well, and this is the thing, it, it sort of puts up a barrier for... Uh, it's, it's quite an anti-immigration move. Because, uh, you know, new entrants to, to Wales uh, that, that aren't familiar with the language, they're certainly not going to be familiar with the Welsh language. I mean, most Welsh yeah. people aren't familiar with the, with the Welsh language. And why bother? Like, it doesn't matter if it's called Caimru or whatever. Like, it's still not going to qualify <laughs> for the... I think you don't make any effort to pronounce it It's not going to qualify for the World Cup. No, well, well you're using my alphabet. I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> I'm going to pronounce it the way it's written. And that goes for you to see your pan. <laughs> OK, see your pan. Thank you. What, what do you think? I uh, think Julie? I think it's a great idea. If that's what they want to do, then, then, then why not? Like, think... uh, the camera... Yeah, why not? Well, what about, though... Uh, I mean, I, I know a, num a number of Welsh people who don't speak Welsh, and they get a bit fed up uh, because they don't ever get in included in all sorts of various cultural matters because of this sort of snobbishness about it. And a lot of the people who speak Welsh come from sort of upper-middle-class backgrounds because they go to the posh schools where you get to teach Welsh as well. There's a class issue there as well. I, I think it's quite charming. I don't, I, don't, I don't see a massive issue. Obviously, when you point out that you know, others are 
are not happy about it. But if it's something, if they do a vote and people kind of that's the majority, that that's that's maybe they do both. But maybe they can maybe, do both. Yeah, and, both. And it's a way of separating uh, the cultures and separating the people. And we've seen this in Scotland with the, the push of, of Gaelic, uh, so you know, which is the equivalent of Welsh. It's a pointless dead language that you know is being uh, resurrected for political reasons. Oh, I'm going to see lots of tweets from Welsh people now after this. Yeah, well, they'll all be in Welsh, so nobody will care. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a way of separating people and creating a separate identity. And it's weird that we're in this culture where you know we're, we're supposed to be breaking down barriers and making sure everybody's included and at the same time the, the is, is can also considered woke to be to be creating separate enclave, enclaves of people it's almost as though there's a the hypocrisy within the woke movement <laughs> <laughs> who'd, who'd have thought? The anyway, first ever one a final question now is from Sam Sam says should Rishi Sunak sack Gavin Williamson for bullying. OK, so this is following the revelation. There were text messages that Gavin Williamson sent to the then chief whip, uh, Wendy Morton, following the Queen's state funeral. And apparently Williamson swore uh, several times in the messages and he also accused Morton of using the death of the Queen to punish Tory MPs who were not favoured by Liz Truss. But Rishi Sunak is standing by uh, the Cabinet Office Minister. Uh, he's been sacked before a couple of times. Yeah, he's got no, form. I read, I read those messages. He's a very <laughs> angry man. He is not coping well with no nut November. That is, <laughs> Let's not go into the details of what that means for our yeah. younger audience. But what do you think? I mean, are they? I mean, I haven't our, read our that. Young, our younger audience is about forty-three. That's correct. Yeah, but they're very delicate people. Um, uh, what, the messages I haven't read, but they're quite uh, explicit. They're, they're incredibly, like, like, aggressive, just right? vociferously angry and like way over the top. Like if that was if that was my my wife, uh, you know, somebody at her work messaging that. I mean, I'd be going down there kicking in the House of Parliament. But is, isn't the whip meant to be quite aggressive? I mean, isn't that sort of the role? Isn't it a bit like the kind of Malcolm Tucker figure from the thick of it? Yeah. They're meant to be kind of intimidated because otherwise you just ignore them, right? But there's no sort of reciprocation. The, the person uh, on, the other, on the other, on the receiving end just seemed to be being cowed and it wasn't, it didn't seem an appropriate use right. of uh, bullying language. I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of times... Because uh, you're quite pro-bullying. Well, a lot of times workplace bullying is, is a great way to get things done. But this, <laughs> this didn't seem like, uh, it seemed... Uh, it seemed like he was just miffed at the fact that he didn't get to go to the Queen's funeral, this which is, was probably pretty boring anyway. This is the first time that Leo has been on the side of the, uh, the person being bullied as opposed to the bully. That's quite a refreshing Yeah, that is, that is quite an interesting... I don't know, he did... Maybe maybe somebody gave you something in the audience has made you softer. I yeah, don't softer, know exactly. What's happened, Leo? <laughs> uh, what, I mean, uh, no, I'm not... I'm, I just think if he was accused... If he's actually bullied someone, then, uh, you know, there's no excuse for that. And I know you don't think you see everyone <laughs> to be bullied. Well, you know, some of us have been bullied, but the, or some of us have been bullied, but it doesn't matter. If he did that in this position, and I think, like, the Prime Ministers have been... You know, they need to learn... They actually learn the lesson. When you defend someone who's indefensible, you know, it always comes back and bites you. Why do these people text this stuff? Obviously, that's going to leave. Yeah, he's a politician. Like, if you're going to bully oh. someone, do it verbally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the, the way you should do it. If you need to hit them, use a sack of oranges, because it doesn't leave a mark. And Some... Chinese burns. That's, yeah, that's, Chinese that's burns. what I do too. That's racist. Though, that's no that's looking... racist. OK, so we're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> After the break on Free Speech Nation, we're going to be talking about the case of a Belgian woman who was suffering from depression when the country's government allowed her to go ahead uh, with a euthanasia procedure. Very serious stuff. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun. Every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Every Saturday at two o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. The European Court of Human Rights has ruled that the Belgian government did not violate the rights of a person suffering from depression when she went ahead with a euthanasia procedure. Uh, Godeliva de Troye died in 2012. At the time, she'd been suffering from chronic depression for around 40 years. Uh, the, EH, the ECHR judges found in favour of the Belgian authorities in three out of four counts. Tom Mortier, who is de Troye's son, took the Belgian government to court. Mortier was re represented by Robert Clark, who is the deputy director for ADF International in Vienna, and he joins me now. Welcome to the show. Robert, could you tell me the outcome Hi, of, of your case? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it goes back to 2012 when Tom's mother was euthanized. She was physically healthy. She was 64, and Tom found out about it the next day when his wife took a call from the hospital saying, his mum had been euthanized. Could he come in and, and make the necessary arrangements? Since then, he has been pursuing some measure of justice. Nothing could bring her back, obviously, but he's pursued it through an attempted criminal complaint in Belgium. The prosecutor lost it, and then it went nowhere. A medical complaint in Belgium, it went nowhere. He was blocked from access for or access to the, the, the file. There's a particular euthanasia form that gets filled out in all of these cases. It was blocked to him, and it was blocked by the chair of the euthanasia commission that approved the euthanasia. Now, one really important thing here is the guy doesn't just head the commission that blocked the document. He's not just an outspoken euthanasia advocate in Belgium. He is the doctor who euthanized Tom's mother. So the same man that euthanized her legally approved the euthanasia and then stopped Tom from accessing the document. And so it's taken 10 years, but, but finally, after that time, he has received at least some measure of justice from the European Court, which ruled that Belgium had violated his mother's right to life. This is a shocking story because, you know, this is a woman who is physically healthy, suffering from depression, uh, and, and therefore potentially not in the best place to make that kind of uh, decision. And the fact that he wasn't informed and was told the day after, I mean, this, this seems unfathomable to me. It seems unfathomable to me, and it, it was to him. I mean, Tom, Tom lives in a country that legalized euthanasia in 2002. 
Um, we've seen two things happen in that time. The, the qualifying criteria get blown open. So it, it's initially touted as this rare, exceptional thing. And, and then surely enough, it gets expanded to, to more and more conditions, more and more people. Belgium removed any lower age limit in 2014. So you have children uh, as young as um, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 being euthanized in Belgium at this point. And you see the number of cases going up almost every single year. The pandemic was the only period in that 20 years of legalization where the number of cases didn't go up. So you're now at something like seven euthanasias per day. Every single day, seven people are being euthanized in Belgium. And you see similar things in all of the other um, countries that have gone down this path, like Canada and, and so on. And I think the reality is that the slippery slope is is on display. You, you see that um, from the numbers and you see it from the tragic facts of, of this case. Um, Tom didn't oppose euthanasia. Tom said he hadn't really thought about it before this happened to his mother. He lived in Belgium. He knew it was a thing there. And he'd not given it much thought until it came to affect him. And so I, I've been deeply affected by speaking to him, just thinking through euthanasia. It's this idea of autonomy that someone should just be able to do whatever they want. But we don't live in a truly autonomous society. We live in a right. society where we have relationships and, and where we, we have a common duty of care, of looking after one another. And when something happens to one person, of course, it affects others. And so euthanasia affects the doctors who are involved, the medical staff, and it, it has most definitely affected Tom in this case. I mean, this is the issue, isn't it? It's such an emotive subject. And of course, when people do push for euthanasia laws, they are often doing so out of, a, 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 out of compassion. Uh, but it's, but the, the counter argument to that, of course, is that it is open to corruption and people will needlessly die. And from what you're describing, uh, the evidence is in on that. Would that be right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the, the judgment, and you, you said that the court found in favour of Belgium on, on three of the four counts. And, and that's right if you kind of divide these counts equally. But, but I think it's a significant loss for Belgium. For one, it's been found to violate the right to life. <laughs> there is no right more um, valuable than the right to life. If we don't have the right to, to life, then, then we can't enjoy any, any other rights. Um, but secondly, and, and perhaps most importantly, Belgium says that euthanasia is safe because of the safeguards. Um, the problem is that Belgium has two principal safeguards, I would suggest. The first is this commission that reviews euthanasia, euthanasia cases and, and approves them after the event. How that's a measure of safety, someone else would have to tell me. And if the commission have any doubt as to the um, whether or not a case has complied with the law, then they can refer them to the prosecutor. So you have these twin pillars of safeguard. In this case, the two findings, or the finding of a violation of the right to life, was based on the fact that the commission was biased. It lacked independence, the court said, because the very doctor who euthanized Tom's mother sat on it and, according to the Belgian government, unanimously approved her euthanasia. And not only did the commission lack independence, but the prosecutor who lost a then took three Um, the process of investigation. So when Belgium says euthanasia that argument doesn't hold water. And, and Robert, could you explain investigations? Because that sounds like that, that requires some kind of further investigation, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and he has sat there for some time. He has led tours of Auschwitz, which he said were intended to provoke discussions about death and dignity. Um, he is something of a, a, a celebrity figure in Belgium. I think he won Humanist of the Year a couple of years ago. And yet he sits on this panel. He carries out euthanasias. He's head of one of the leading euthanasia lobby organizations. He's connected to other doctors who were involved in this case and who, who referred amongst themselves. And so Belgium now has to look at this judgment and has to um, carry it out. They, they have to bring their law into alignment. And so um, while the court didn't say it has to drop its law, or it has to reverse its law completely, they at the very least have to consider the position of this commission. And, and, and what's really left for me is if the commission, which has now approved almost 30,000 euthanasias, if the commission lacks independence, how can we be sure that those 30,000 don't contain many, many, many more tragedies just like this? And, and actually, the true number is far more than that. There's a, there's a study that came out some years ago that suggests even the reporting in Belgium is probably at around 50%. There are many doctors who, who don't consider that their actions need reporting. Um, there are many doctors who don't consider 
um, themselves subject to the commission in this way. So the true number is likely to be much higher. And the I, I think in some ways this is probably the tip of the uh, oh, sorry the tip of the iceberg. We've seen other cases even in, in the last week that 23 year old who was euthanized after getting caught up in the Brussels uh, airport bombing by ISIS, not not physically injured, but um, struggling from a mental health perspective, 23 years old, and euthanized in Belgium. But, that, but that's particularly shocking. I mean, do, do any mental health campaigners have anything to say about this? The fact that people with mental health concerns who are not physically harmed can nonetheless be caught up in this kind of legislation? Mm. I, I, there is a there is a, a battle raging in Belgium in, in different ways. The the Belgian media is is relatively uncritical when it comes to euthanasia. It's something that Tom struggled with. He's tried to tell his story in Belgium, not because he he started off having any issue with euthanasia, but because he feels he has has a duty to, to share what he's experienced. And he's tried to share that in Belgium, and he struggled to, to to find anyone or to find many platforms where he can do that. Yet when he tells it outside of Belgium, there's a lot more interest because we really have a, a, an example of what euthanasia in practice looks like. You know, we have countries that have looked at it, Bill in Scotland and um, a number of other European countries right now. And, and what I say to them is you don't, you don't have to come up with some hypothetical slippery slope. You don't have to imagine what it looks like. We, we have countries, a handful, but a handful with a 20-year history. So let's look at what happened. And on the mental health front, the number of cases are going up. And not only is the number of cases going up in Belgium for mental health conditions, um, there is a, a movement to try and expand the law. So we have people talking about euthanasia for dementia. You have people talking about uh, or the possibility to sign what they call advanced directives. So you sign and you say, I'd like to be euthanized in these circumstances, which presupposes you won't be mentally competent at that point, but you will be euthanized on the basis of what you'd written five, 10, uh, or, or potentially more years prior to that moment. So the mental health part is 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 particularly concerning. Um, th there have been a number of professors and, and others who've spoken out in Belgium recently. In fact, a member of the commission um, who's spoken out to say, I have some hesitations with this. But in Belgium, it's largely uncritical. And I think that should be a wake-up call to, to, to all of us, really. Well, Robert Clark, thanks very much for coming on to talk about this largely unknown issue. Thank you very much. After the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be talking to the woman who was branded hateful by a senior academic at Cambridge University. See you in a few minutes. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice we are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30 a.m. every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. 
So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. To Free Speech Nation. A Cambridge University College has lost funding from some former students after branding a gender critical speaker hateful. So last month, Gonville and Keys College invited author Helen Joyce to talk about gender identity ideology. Uh, but before the debate, the college's master, Professor Pippa Rogerson, told students that Joyce's views were polemics. Another senior official at Cambridge University apologised for the distress caused by sending them an email invitation to the talk. Uh, now, alumni of the college, which is the fourth oldest in Cambridge, say they're withdrawing uh, their donations to the college. Very interesting story. I'm delighted to say Helen Joyce joins me now. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. So, a lot of people might not know uh, about this story. You're obviously best-selling author of the book Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality, uh, and you are talking about these issues of gender identity ideology, and you were invited to Gonville and Keyes College at Cambridge University to give the talk. What happened next? The thing you have to understand is that I was invited because there's a free speech problem at Cambridge. Right. The idea was to show... I mean, the topic of the talk was what happens when speech is silenced. You'd think it might have been a bit of a clue yeah. <laughs> to the idiots who wanted to try silencing the speech. But no, they just like, it's just like this is enormous elephant trap and they just trot along and in they go. Well, they turned up and made a racket outside and tried to stop people getting in. Apparently, yeah. people had to be smuggled in because they were too scared to be seen. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. I mean, so what happened was we advertised it. So I was invited by Arif Ahmed, who is a professor of philosophy at Cambridge, and he is a fellow of Keyes College specifically. Mm -hmm. And so he said, let's, you know, do this talk. And in Anyone who's a fellow of a college can just book a room. So yes. This wasn't a Cambridge event or anything. It's just a 100-seat room. You just advertise it. You send it out on the email list, the same as everybody else. Yes. They refused to send it out. They sent around this email saying that I think it was hateful, offensive... And I forget Insulting, what Insulting, I think the other one might have been. Possibly, yes. Something like that. Yeah, and that I, you know, polemics. And I'm such... I'm so unpolemical, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, so um, I wrote an open letter and... Said it, sent it to them and didn't get an answer, of course. Um, they, this, they... this is quite an... I mean, I consider it a little bit an abuse of power because this is the master of the college and the senior tutor, Pippa Rogerson and Andrew Spencer, yeah. emailing all students and staff yeah. saying, Helen Joyce is hateful, which yeah. I, I consider that to be defamatory. Yeah. Um, and uh, then Arif Ar Ar wants to in email to sort of challenge it. They say, no, you can't use the college right. uh, email to do that. And they sent the email out. They said, you know... Um, we email you not as the master and senior tutor, tutor but as, as Pippa and Andrew. What? And a friend of mine said, like, they're, they're bloody glove puppets on yeah. CBeebies, you know, <laughs> Pips and Andrew, like, so babyish. But also, it was the most babyish thing, this email. you do that, don't use the official uh, well, that, university you know, email. I, that's, a, that's a point. I mean, they're probably breaking GDPR or something there, but, I mean, that's a minor issue in comparison with calling me hateful. So I think that they thought that it was obvious to all right-thinking people you know, everybody right-thinking thinks the same things about absolutely everything. And one of the things they think is that, you know, a woman is anyone who says they're a woman and that anyone who points out the flaws with that theory is hateful. Mm. And so they said that thinking that every right-thinking person would agree with them. And I think they were very surprised at the pushback. Yes. So I got a lot of emails. I was BCC'd into a lot of the emails that were sent to them or that were sent to Keys College to the development office, like yes. where they do fundraising and so on. Like, actually, from lots of people all over the place... People, I didn't, people who were friends of mine, I didn't even realise that they were old uh, Keys graduates. Yes. You know, messaged 
and said, well, I've told them I've taken them out of my will or I'm not leaving them any money well, or I'm they ashamed. They rely on alumni funding, don't yeah, they? Yeah, and it's just shameful. Like, it's actually shameful. But isn't it also in contradiction to the free speech statement by the college online, yeah. which says that they encourage students to hear diverse views? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's the exact opposite here. Well, they had the cheek to say, um, she, so she responded. Pippa sent another email after the event. Now, so what happened during the event was they were told that they could protest, but they couldn't protest inside the college or at the door of the college. Right. So if you, if you walk maybe, I don't know, 50 metres or something down from Keys College, you're sort of at the turning to Market Square and they were there. Yes. They were protesting there. But I don't know where some of them hiding in the college beforehand or what, because about halfway through, they started banging and rattling and things on the door yes. of the room I was in. Now, the video is going to be going up very, very shortly, um, maybe even this evening. And there was a bit for about five minutes where I literally was not audible, but I was really determined that yes. I wasn't being silenced. So I had the mic here and the guy who was recording it turned it right up. And I'm not very sure what I actually said for that five <laughs> minutes, but I didn't stop talking, put it that way. How does that feel to be in the middle of that cacophony? <sighs> I mean, I didn't mind that much, but it did occur to me afterwards, you know, anyone who was in that room who's experienced you know, male violence, like anyone who's experienced domestic violence must have found that quite sickening. Yes. Like the thought that you're in this room and just the other side of the door, there's hate. Because that was hateful, the way yes. they were behaving. That's actual hate. Yes. So afterwards, Pippa sent around another of her, her delightful emails. And um, in it, she said, you know, that she thought that everybody had free speech, including me, as in including her. Yes. You're like, no, that's the heckler's veto, Pippa. Yes. Like, if I'm speaking and you start shouting so loudly that the people who want to hear me cannot hear me, that's not free speech. No, you're taking That's the opposite of free speech. a decision to prevent other people exactly. from hearing. So this is interesting because I, I, I gave a talk at the same college the week after you. I didn't get the drums or anything because I was talking about John Milton and it would be weird, wouldn't it? Yeah. To, to sort of <laughs> get, get upset about the author of Paradise Lost. Yeah. Um, but but um, nevertheless, I spoke to a lot of the students afterwards about your case and the students were really reassuring. They were saying to me things like, you know, those people who turned up to protest, they're obviously undermining themselves by trying to silence uh, a respected I mean. journalist. You know, yeah. I don't think... Is it the case that it's, it's a, a problem with students generally, or is it just a very small minority being egged on by academics like Pippa Rogerson? I mean, is it that they're being egged on? I think that people like Pippa are cowards. I think they're in thrall to the customer. The student is a customer. And it's not just a student, is it? It's, it's like a babyish student. Mm. It's like a kid a toddler who heads off to university and for the first time people say things they don't agree with and they think that that's, you know, literal violence or whatever they call it. All of this. I mean, you know, I've read your book. It's fantastic. It's very compassionate. It's not in any way transphobic. I, I think you would really struggle to even try to insinuate that in anything. Have they read the book? And well, do, they claim and... to have, both of them. But I why mean... are they interpreting it as hate then? Far be it from me <laughs> to put words into somebody else's mouth, but they quoted a particular clip from an interview that I did. So the way it works, like the way that it works when people hate you and when people really want to make it impossible for you to do your job and to get heard and to, you know, get a scandal out there, which is what, by the way, which is what I'm trying to do, like the reason I wrote this damn book is because they are sterilising children in the name of gender medicine. That's the problem. That's the thing I'm doing. That's the reason that, you know, I put myself in these sorts of positions. I wasn't getting paid to do this. Mm. I didn't get paid to turn up and get shouted at by a bunch of stupid students. I just did it because I think I have to. Yes. Anyway, so that's why I'm doing it. And if you, if you, if you support that, <laughs> you've got to try and silence me by kind of any means necessary. And so what you do is you, you memeify the worst thing that you can find in all the hundreds of hours of stuff, you know, between my book, between interviews and so on, yes. you pick a little clip that you can present out of context and the clip they picked is one where I'm trying to explain this is a social contagion. And when you've got a social contagion, which might be something like anorexia or bulimia or cutting, Obviously, what you do is try and limit its spread. Like, you, you hope that it'll burn out. Yes. But you don't just let it burn like you might, you know, for a wildfire. You try to limit it. So I said in this that as few people as possible get caught up in this social contagion. Yes. And this is interpreted 
it's not really interpreted, but people present, pretend they interpret it as that I want to kill these people, yes. that I want there to be fewer trans people by killing them, you know? That's interesting, isn't it? Because we continually hear rhetoric like you're trying to erase our existence. I know. And, and it's obviously the most uncharitable thing to say because nobody wants that and nobody has called for that. And it's the argument seems to be people just scrapping with imaginary enemies all the time. But they're, that's to, they're speaking to their own side. They're not speaking to me and they're not mm. speaking to people who agree with me. They're speaking to the people behind them. And it's called phobia indoctrination and it's a cult technique. So yes. people who run cults, they, um, they try to give the idea and the impression that if you leave the cult or if you listen to people outside the cult, you'll die, you'll actually die. Those people hate you, they want to kill you, they want to end your existence, you know, they want to mandate you out of whatever, blah, 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 you know? So that's what they're saying about me. They're saying, you know, don't listen to her. She's so hateful that if you listen to her, you know, it'll end your existence. Yes. So they've just got to tell these outrageous lies. She should know better. She's a senior academic. Do you know what she is? She's a bloody lawyer who specialises in law about women. Really? Yes. Well, she should have clearly turned up if she had some reservations and had a conversation about this, right? I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the social contagion issue, and this is something you explore in the book. Um, but this is something that is continually denied. I've taught at a girls' school, and I've seen evidence when it comes to bulimia or uh, anorexia. These things, of course, exponentially gather. And it, the evidence is overwhelming when yeah. it comes to gender identity. Yeah. Of the number of girls who are now identifying yeah. out of being female, who are having double mastectomies, all these kind of things, it doesn't feel like it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, challengeable, really. It's Not really, but, I mean, if you can say that, I want to be lining people up against the wall and shooting them, I think you can say, frankly, anything. So then how do we get around this? If we have uh, one side of this debate who are just determined not to converse, to have no debate, but also to accuse you in this defamatory way of being hateful and having malevolent intent, how do we get beyond this? Well, we keep having events until they give up. So at the end, of, I did, I did, I sometimes when I'm speaking, you know, I can see there's a joke coming up and that it's possibly not wise to say it. <laughs> I don't know if this happens if you're an actual stand-up comedian, oh, but I said it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, so Arif at the end said, you know, it's great to have you sort of thing or whatever. And um, I said, um, yeah, the, the punishment lectures will continue until morale improves. So yes, we will just keep having events cool. until it gets through their thick heads that no, they can't shout people they disagree with down. We are going to keep saying these things. Yes. And your book is a big part of that, of course. But, but you were drawn into this um, almost by accident, wasn't it? It wasn't something that you have had a, a huge interest in for decades. It's not like that, is no, it? No, no, no. I just stumbled across it. I was just editing, you know, ordinary articles about this, that and the other at The Economist. And then somebody said, you know, have you seen this thing that kids keep identifying as trans, coming home and saying such and such as trans? And I was like, oh, no, haven't seen anything about that. I'll look into it for you if you like. And here I am, five years later, you know, threatening to slaughter vast swathes of humanity, apparently. <laughs> Well, that's the other thing that I find incomprehensible about this, is that so many of the people from the gender-critical stance are old, left-leaning, left feminists. Old. Not old, <laughs> as in old school. And I'm not left-leaning, <laughs> And the you're way. not left-leaning, no, but... <laughs> so you're, all wrong. <laughs> but I'm talking about all of those people. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. talking about uh, as, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a sort of contingent. These aren't people who have come from a hateful background. And th this idea that they've all suddenly overnight decided that they hate a certain uh, uh, demographic of the country. It doesn't make any sense. No, it, none of it makes any sense, though. I mean, if you're willing to believe that men can be women, frankly, I, there's bridges I'd like to sell you, but you can believe anything. Yes. So, I, I mean, in a way, I've stopped wondering how they can believe such bizarre things. The yeah. whole thing's bizarre. Does this put you off doing these sort of events? I mean, you, uh, you say we need to do more and more of these events, yeah. but it must be wearing and it must be intimidating to have this kind of treatment. <gasps> I didn't feel intimidated on the night. I did feel very sick as soon as it had finished. Like, he just actually, like, I thought I'd throw up sort of thing, mm. and I did just go rather than talk to people, but I felt fine about 20 minutes later. Yes. I mean, I'm, it's, it's been... I'm way too far in to go back now, so yes. the only way is forward. And also, it's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> but like, <laughs> like, it's so babyish. Like, you know, I'm the eldest of nine kids. I'm not sure that's a fact about me that you know. I'm the eldest of nine kids. I have seen a lot of toddler tantrums. Yes. And the big problem when a toddler is tantruming is not laughing. Yes. Because you mustn't laugh because it just drives them into higher you know, <laughs> fre frenzy. You've got to take it very seriously, but you can't engage. You have to just let them do their thing and, you know, just be very calm and grown up and then they get over it. So a bunch of toddler students are tantruming. We just have to let it wear out. And, and laugh at them. 
Maybe, maybe afterwards. Maybe afterwards, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Helen, uh, just before you go, could you just uh, tell us a little bit about Sex Matters, what you're doing with them? Right, so I'm on leave of absence from The Economist at the moment to work with Sex Matters, which is a human rights organisation that lobbies for clarity about what sex means in law and life. Because yeah. it pops up in lots of places, you know, single-sex spaces, sports, etc. So I'm working with Maya Forstatter, who lost her job for saying that sex is real and men aren't women, um, and won her case in the Employment Tribunal. Uh, so that's what I'm doing most of the time. The rest of the time, I'm doing my own journalism on my own website, thehelenjoyce.com. OK, and that's how people can yes, read that's what you're doing at the moment, thehelenjoyce.com. Yeah. Well, I would recommend it. Helen, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We did invite Professor Pippa Rogerson to join us on Free Speech, Free Speech Nation this evening. Uh, she told us she was already attending an event. So in a moment, we're going to go through your unfiltered dilemmas on GB News from 9 o'clock. On Mark Dolan tonight, as nurses plan to go on strike, I'm sorry, but no one's getting a pay rise because we spent two and a half years destroying the economy. Well done, everyone. As the COP27 summit starts in Egypt, is the policy of net zero undemocratic? We'll debate that with politics legend Anne Widdicombe and former Labour MP Simon Danchuk. And my Mark Meets guest is former Deputy PM of New Zealand, Winston Peters, a man who's often clashed with woke tyrant Jacinda Ardern. Plus tomorrow's papers and my all-star panel. See you at nine. And we're at the end of the show, so we're going to be talking through some of your unfiltered dilemmas. And our first dilemma is from Claire. And Claire has got this to say. I am the bridesmaid for my best friend, but I've been made to pay for my own dress. <laughs> Additionally, it's absolutely hideous to look at. Do you really think you should treat people at your wedding like this? Leo. Take it out of the present. Or if, if it costs more than the present, give her a bill. I mean, that's not really entering into the spirit of the thing, is it? But yeah. But, but no, you're right. They've got to look after the bridesmaids. They shouldn't be made. But they look stupid anyway. Th those taffeta dresses. Yeah, yeah. And the whole They're... point is, like, I mean, you shouldn't you shouldn't force somebody to pay for their own humiliation. That's... No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that? Do you like I weddings? Think, I think she should bill her for the for the bridesmaid dress. Get a really nice one. Yes. And just say either either pay this bill. Or I'm not coming to the wedding. It'd be one bridesmaid short. I mean, goodness me, this all sounds very kind of antagonistic for a, for a matrimonial. Or, but nevertheless... Get, get married and do the same to her, but make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the revenge. OK, we've got another dilemma now from Paul. Paul says, I absolutely love my two Yorkshire Terriers. My house is full of pictures of Timmy and Frankie. I'm moving house soon and my son is annoyed. My furry babies are getting their own master bedroom. Is he just being too soft? So you're giving Timmy and Frankie a master bedroom, is that... What's going on there? I'm more concerned that he talked about his furry babies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should imagine since he's actually got children, he's referring to his sons. So the uh, fact that they're soft means that their, their fur is very well conditioned. I think he's talking about the dogs. Yeah, I hope he's he... talking about the dogs. But I mean, don't call, <laughs> don't call anything a fur baby unless you squeeze it <laughs> through your own vagina. It is not a fur baby. Oh, well, on that graphic <laughs> note... Um, I, if Esther Ranson's still taking those calls, I think the kids should be phoning up. That line <laughs> and, and just reporting his dad because that's wrong. Blimey. Okay, yeah, we've got. Don't put an age limit on that, did we? Final dilemma. Blame. Final dilemma. We've just got time for this. This is from Femi. Femi says During a work outing, I lost my shirt after some drunken antics. Interesting. I had to take the tube home half naked. How do I face my co workers next week? Yeah, we've all done stuff when we're drunk and we've embarrassed ourselves at work, right? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, losing your shirt, that's not really, that's not much of a... It's much not that bad, is it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, unless, like, what, what's it got? Unless he's an, inc an incredibly furry baby. And then, <laughs> <laughs> you must have done something. Who, who made him take the tube up where? We don't have the details. Of, okay. So, Gina, we don't have the details, <laughs> I'm afraid. But listen, everyone, thanks so much for joining us for Free Speech Nation. And this was the week when Belgium was slammed by Europe's highest human rights court over its euthanasia practice. Gary Neville got a grilling on Have I Got News For You. And the culture wars escalated to celebrate the trans disabled. Anyway, thank you very much to my panel, Leo Kurse and Sajida Kershey, and to my guests, David Campanali, Dr. Peter Hughes, Fraser Myers, Robert Clark, and Helen Joyce. And if you want to join us live in the studio and be part of our wonderful audience, you can do that. Just go to sroaudiences.com. Stay tuned for the brilliant Mark Dolan tonight. That is next. And please do not forget that Headliners is on every night at 11 o'clock. I often host that show. That's the late night paper preview show where comedians talk you through the next day's top news story. So please don't miss that and join it. That's going to be happening tonight at 11 o'clock. Thank you ever so much for watching Free Speech Nation. I'll be seeing you here next week at 7 o'clock. Farewell. <laughs>
Let's look ahead to tomorrow's weather. And the UK will be dry towards the east, but cloudy for most, with rain pushing in from the southwest. Here are the details. Starting off across northern Scotland, and here it may be a little bit chilly at first due to clear skies overnight. Further south and west, it will be cloudy and very wet. It will also be cloudy and wet across much of Northern Ireland. Here the rain could be heavy at times, and it will be windy too. There will be some very heavy rain across Cumbria, which could lead to some flooding and difficult driving conditions. Cloudy and damp elsewhere in the northwest. Parts of Wales will also have a very wet morning as a band of rain pushes eastwards. Western parts are likely to have the heaviest rain and the strongest winds as well. Meanwhile, across the West Midlands, it will be cloudy with some rain, but further east across the East Midlands, there will be clear spells and some mist and fog is possible. Also clear skies and a little bit of mist and fog perhaps across East Anglia. Here it will be blustery and not as windy as further west, turning cloudy and wet later. Across the southern counties, there are set to be quite a few showers around. Some of these could be quite heavy and it'll be windy across the coasts as well. The cloudy, wet and windy weather will spread to most parts through the morning and the rain will turn heavy for some. That's how the weather is shaping up during tomorrow morning. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the talking pints we're over a drink, we have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a great Come and join me on Farage. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart over 40 years. Here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB Tomorrow's papers. If it's a important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. 
And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, nurses deserve a pay rise, as do millions of other hard-working Brits. But we've smashed the economy. Well done, everyone. My Mark Meets guest is the former Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand and a man who has clashed with Jacinda Ardern on more than one occasion. Democratic. I'll debate that with former Conservative Minister Anne Widdicombe and ex-Labour Party MP Simon Danchuk. I'll see you after the headlines. What's going to be a very busy show? Here's Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Hundreds of people have been protesting outside the Manston Immigration Centre, demanding it be shut down. Action against detention and deportation campaigners are also calling for Home Secretary Suella Braverman to resign. The site has been at the centre of a crisis this week after it emerged it was over capacity, with some asylum seekers describing conditions as being like a prison. Downing Street says the numbers have now fallen to 2,600. Well, the government has announced that a pilot scheme to reduce the backlog in asylum claims will be rolled out nationwide by 2023. The Home Office says an eight-week test run reduced the time asylum seekers waited for a first interview by around 40 per cent. Almost 100,000 migrants are currently waiting for a decision on their asylum claims. Home Secretary Suella Braverman says this will speed up the process. The government says it has contingency plans in place if nurses go on strike amid a growing threat of industrial...